Hey, QQ here again, joined by Johnny D, here to do a weekly update on what is happening now with regards to the consumer revolt known as Gamergate. So I picked one hell of a week to do a status update like this. Things, well, happened, and kept on happening. It was like a wild ride of happenings. So in no particular order, here's what's up. So I thought I'd get right to the point. Actually, it is about ethics in games journalism, right? And what a week it was. A new low score, as you could say. First of all, this guy, Nathan fucking Grayson. If I never saw his name or face again, I couldn't be happier. Now, I got a little bit of flack for using the term anti-gamer in my videos. When I had the reasoning explained to me, it made sense. Some of anti-gamergate are gamers, and stereotyping them like that is unfair and is playing identity politics right back at them. But Nathan Grayson, someone who's actively trying to phase out the word gamer, I'll continue to call him, Leigh Alexander, Dan Golding, and the other attempted murderers of the gamer identity anti-gamer. So what is Nathan Grayson up to this time? Well, first of all, he wrote an article on a former co-worker without disclosing it. Both Nathan Grayson and Robert Yang worked at Rock Paper Shotgun at the same time. And he didn't disclose it in his article on Yang's game about simulating gay sex with a stick shift car? Wait, what? Anyway, as minor as this offense sounds, it is his duty to the consumer to inform them about any possible biases that might influence his writing. Steven Totillo, malevolent dictator of Kotaku, dismissed this claim because while Grayson and Yang worked at the same publication at the same time, apparently they didn't work together and weren't close. Also, the gay sex stick shift game was a free one. But when you're trying to make a name for yourself in an industry, good press is good press. Think for yourself on this one. Would your interests as a member of the video game consuming populace be served by knowing about Grayson's ties to Yang? If even a small percentage of viewers think so, then it should have been disclosed. Think we're done with Grayson? I wish. I wish Kotaku was done with Grayson. So the second thing Nathan Grayson was discovered to have done was to have paid $800 to a certain game developer. Yes, that person again. Now, how he chooses to spend his love or money is fine unless the person involved in the sexual or financial transaction becomes the subject of one of his articles. And sure enough, she was mentioned again in an article he wrote about the GDC. While their dating relationship was disclosed in that article, their financial relationship was not. Again, this might seem like a small offense, but a pattern is starting to emerge here. This is what, the fifth or sixth time Nathan Grayson has been caught writing without proper disclosure? I'm sure there's plenty of times we don't know about, too. So Kotaku, Totillo, can we start letting these people go? Oh, right, you'd probably have to lay off half your staff. Why let Kotaku have all the love? Polygon deserves a bit of the unethical action too, right? Michael McWerther, deputy news editor for Polygon, purchased the domain legodimensions.com, the name of an upcoming Lego game, and pointed it at an article he wrote on the game, out of the hopes that it would generate clicks. While Kotaku journalist Jason Schreier thought this was fucking hilarious, everyone else can see that this is both a shitty thing to do and an unethical thing to do. Even Ian Miles Prower Chong called him out on it. It turns out this wasn't the only domain Vox was squatting either. A senior engineer for the company was squatting officialdestinymagazine.com and amused himself by pointing it at various different locations after it was noticed. So to conclude this segment, is games journalism still crap? Yes. So congratulations, Gamergate, on moving on from video games and onto science fiction. Don't know what I'm talking about? Let me give you a little bit of background info. Hang on until the end. Gamergate is involved somehow. The Hugo Awards, the best-known award for science fiction works, was observed to be falling into some cliquish behaviors. Odd works pushing a social justice agenda were winning, and there were whisper campaigns to exclude authors with problematic ideas. Larry Correa was one of the first authors to make this observation, and in 2013, he decided to shake things up a bit by instructing his fans on how to sign up for the nomination process. He used pictures of sad puppies as part of the campaign. The year after that, in 2014, he published a slate of works and authors, the Sad Puppies Slate, and suggested that those should be nominated by his fans. Most of those selected were to the right of the clique members, which really doesn't take much considering the clique members were very, very far left. Some of the authors on the slate did make it through the nomination process, and just as predicted, there was much outrage from the clique members. This proved that political bias was part of the criteria that the clique was using to select works and authors for nomination. Finally, in 2015, new slates were published. One by Brad Torgerson and Korea, another by author Vox Day. 
and this time, more than just a few authors from the slates were nominated. Some of the smaller categories were completely filled by authors and works from the slates. Now, I should mention that the clique had used their own lists before this. Korea and Day weren't doing anything against the rules, or even novel. But the media revved up its smear engines and published hit piece after hit piece about how the slates were filled with white straight males, and were therefore racist or something. Another quote-unquote fact that was tossed around was that the Sad Puppies campaign was somehow affiliated with Gamergate. Some articles even went so far as to credit Gamergate with its creation. Just a few little problems. If you understand the concept of how time works, you'd realize that Sad Puppies predates Gamergate by quite a bit. Not only that, but most of Gamergate had never heard of the Sad Puppies, or were only checking in on it occasionally due to sharing common ideological opponents. Another problem was that the media was again erasing the very existence of women and minorities, as the slate was anything but all white and all male. It was even pretty broad politically. But anything going against the SJW narrative suddenly becomes right-wing, white, and masculine for some reason. Some of the articles, like the one that Entertainment Weekly wrote, were so bad that they had to issue corrections. Some of the corrections got so huge that they basically invalidated most of the rest of the article. So congratulations to mainstream journalism, too. Couldn't let games journalism upstage you in biased coverage now, could you? So what does Jonathan McIntosh really mean when he makes Anita use the word pernicious all the time to describe video games? Well, pernicious means having a gradual harmful effect. So if it could be proved that video games do not have a harmful effect, then there goes that narrative, right? A new article popped up on the National Institute of Health's website about a three-year study on the long-term effects of video games on sexist attitudes. And what they found confirmed my suspicions from my intro videos. People's sexist attitudes were not related to the types of games that they play, nor the amount of time per day spent playing. It appears that cultivation theory does not apply to games and sexist attitudes. So, of course, the anti-gamer gators decided to stage their own reverse tour de France. They backpedaled hard, trying to claim that they were in fact saying that gamers are sexists, and that games are just pandering to that demographic. Oh sure, that's what you were trying to say this whole time. You were just using those big words like pernicious because you thought that they sounded cool, right? So a new operation was staged on Thursday night to inform neutral parties about the existence and insidious nature of the Atheism Plus Blockbot and the GG Autoblocker. These are automated programs that generate block lists against large swaths of Twitter users so you can subscribe to them if you're afraid of other people's ideas. The Atheism Plus block bot is report-based and includes Christina Hoff Summers for being the wrong kind of feminist, Mark Kern for being the wrong kind of game developer, and Richard Dawkins for being the wrong kind of atheist. The GG Autoblocker is based on who you follow. If you follow two or more people who have been deemed important ringmasters of Gamergate, it adds you to a block list. These block lists are pretty insidious. They are dividing Twitter along ideological lines. For example, GamerX, a convention that tries to be queer-friendly, uses GG Autoblocker to block tons of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans people on Twitter because they follow the wrong accounts. So this operation was to raise awareness about these block lists. Participation was simple, just post with the hashtag AreYouBlocked, along with information on how to find out if you are. The operation ended up being a huge success. The creator of GG Autoblocker got salty and decided to make a new custom block list for anyone who tweeted using the Are You Blocked hashtag. It trended on Twitter too, so a lot of people ended up seeing the hashtag. So Gamergate is dead, but we can still trend a hashtag on demand. Well, that's a convincing argument. Maybe they just think we're dead because they're all blocking us. Anyway, as I said, this week was a busy one. There were things I had to leave out, so feel free to check the Get Good timeline if you want the gaps filled in. I'll put the link in the description. I can't promise I'll make one of these videos every week, but I'll try to make one for the particularly happening weeks. Feel free to subscribe or to follow me on Twitter. Ciao!